Hey, good news, everybody. Hey, what is your good news? I'm, I'm switching to minimal view. There we go. Oh, okay. now we're ready. We're ready oh, to hold roll. On. Hold on. Hey, let me, try, let me try that again. Hey, good news, everybody. <laughs> Hey, you want to start an episode? Uh, I don't know. All right, we don't have to. Uh, let's do it anyway. All right. <laughs> so you know, you know what I was thinking about our, our show, Matthew. I'm, is I'm curious to know what you're. One thinking. one thing <laughs> that we're we're missing, or we've been missing. Oh shit! This is a real thing we're missing. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. I'm, let me write yeah. it down. All right. Go. Drum rolls. So. Okay. All right. You know, you know what today's topic is? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, that's future Matthew putting in the sound of a drum roll. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, we were going to talk about design systems. Yeah, they're great. Design I mean, systems can, can be great. And you know, what's ironic about this topic is we were kind of bashing them a few episodes ago in season, season two. <laughs> yeah. Here's why they might work. Why you might want one. Yeah. So our special guest today is David Malouf. Um, hey, David. Hey. Scoot on in here. Hey, guys. Oh. <laughs> Damn it. And here, here's me without a sock puppet with googly eyes. <laughs> uh, now my stomach hurts from laughing. <laughs> oh, uh, goodness. All right. Uh, it's that was silly. Talking earlier about doing a, an episode about design systems, pattern libraries, all those, mm -hmm. all those intertangled artifacts that are, are part of enterprise, typically design, design shops. And we thought we would talk about the pros, cons, issues, risks, all those kinds of things that, that go along with endeavoring setting something up like that, because it is a large task. It is a large and continuous task. Yes. That gets less large over time, but... Right, but the maintenance, I think that's, I mean, not to jump to the, to the conclusion. <laughs> Let's jump to the conclusion. <laughs> so, so first of all, you get your design system. <laughs> Once that's all done, then you have this whole problem with maintaining it. And that's a whole ongoing task of someone or some people yeah. to, uh, you know, kind of be the gatekeepers and, you know, make sure it's still uh, fulfilling its its true purpose. The first huge effort is getting the organization to buy into the need in the first place. And the second right. huge effort is building it. And the third huge effort is keeping it relevant. Yeah, exactly. Right. And uh, you know, a, a lot of times companies don't even know they need it. So they're kind of in this floundering mode, even before they ask for the business to, to pay for it or support it, they're in this, you know, floundering, you know, back and forth with development. They're making one-off controls. It's a little haphazard and unorganized as you would expect, which is all the things that the, the pattern library design system would solve if done correctly. But it's, it's not a, a cheap endeavor. It's not a quick endeavor. Depending on the size, you're talking about doing the full-on current state inventory. You're talking about budgeting to get software to manage. You're talking about getting training and developing the new system is a huge undertaking. Yeah. And you're also talking about getting a good portion of the organization to buy into doing it. And I don't just mean buy in philosophically, but buying in with budget and time to establish it and, and maintain it. It's not an easy task. And that's, I think why a lot of companies are like, well, let's, let's, we'll do that next year. Right. Uh, and it'll change workflows for not just the designers, but all the other R and D teams, mm -hmm. even potentially reaching it beyond R and D developers, QA content, if it's going to span into your content development. Yeah. It's going to touch a lot of, a lot of parts of the business. A little background. Part of the reason we're talking about this, I'm working with someone as I guess I'm a mentor. I'm a mentor. The woman that I've been talking with is in a position where she's got to come up with a design system she knows it's necessary and her her initial ask was like how do I even start she said one of the the areas of pushback that she's getting from doing it is from engineering because two things one design is always changing its mind I put some air quotes around that but she said but that's kind of fair too because we are doing that and we need to get that in order so that's one aspect of a design system that needs to be in place and then two 
It's, you know, all right, we, we've got this component and maybe we make a change to that component. Now we have to test it everywhere it's being used, even though we're only changing it because of this little tiny project. Yep. And so it's, it's a big amount of effort, but I think, I think it is. It is. I agree. Some effort for sure. I mean, but... that's part of the, I was mentioning the, the change in workflow, like everyone has to be aware of a lot of stuff. The third thing that came up was you, you touched on this a second ago about content. So there's with, with her company, they do healthcare education stuff. So they produce videos, both animated and live action videos for people doing physical therapy and, and things like that. So they've got the, the sort of the branding look and feel things that are in the content itself. And then they've also got the marketing side of the house. And then they've got the, the product development side of the house. And one of the things that came up when we were talking yesterday was the color blue, the brand color blue, which is not accessible where it gets used throughout different treatments. It doesn't have enough contrast with the background color that it gets put on. And so her question was, all right, for the sake of consistency and for the sake of like you know, having color that we all agree on, do we just buy into what they're doing or do we push for an accessible color? I'm, I'm throwing that out there as an example of these moments where it's not just going to be, hey, let's have a design system. We'll take a hit now, but we'll save time later. But it's also this larger conversation with whoever owns the brand and the company um, and the changes that may have to be made because of that. It really is a company-wide effort. Right. And it, and it is an effort. And to go back to your point on consistency, it's the user experience, which is really the driving force that needs consistency, because that's what you see in the large organizations is it's so large. You've got, you know, these different silos and everyone knows how we feel about silos. <laughs> Before them? <laughs> no, we're against them. <laughs> Anti-silo. Companies always say we want consistency. And this is one way to achieve that is to build a design system, invest in a design system, understand that it's going to take work, time, money, like you said, but the results, if done properly, is a streamlined process, better consistency for users, better consistency, good consistency for designers and engineers. Yeah. Because you know, I talk to companies and they spin their wheels like, oh, we got to build this new control from scratch. And they don't even realize that it's been in this other part of the system for two years and they could just reuse it. Yeah. So there's this you know, exposure of what's already there and able to reuse, which will ultimately save time in the long run. Right. And even just, you know, your, your team of designers. So she's talking about they're bringing on a new designer sometime in the new year when that designer onboards. And their first project is to design some little widget or something. Are they going to do it from scratch and be like, Hey, I did it for you. And it, it looks nothing like what they do. And, Oh yeah, I, I tried to make it a lot like yours, but I thought, you know, the rounded corners looked better than the square corners. So I went with that right. and, and having that, you know, at least from the design team's perspective, presenting a unified, it's not a fight. It shouldn't be a fight. So I, I really don't want to say unified front, but sort of a, a unified perspective of this is what we think is true. And this is what we think is, is the best user experience that we can provide. Wrapped into that, how does it look, but how does it work? Yes, right? absolutely. we've all seen applications where this control drop down, whatever works one way and slightly different in another part of the system. And that's a very bad thing <laughs> and, and confusing it. And to your point, what I, what I tell clients when they kind of come up with these questions to me is, well, here's a problem. We already have this control and someone has a new idea to make it better, to improve it. Great. But that change should be rolled into the overall design wide control. That's right. you know, no one offs unless there's a really, really good reason to have or, one or where if you have this, this great new idea and we all are like, yeah, that does make sense. The first step should be, all right, where are all the instances of this and how will this change break? Will it break anything? Will it diminish the user experience? And if so, what's the risk with that? And a good system should indicate that to the teams, right? They should be able to go and find all those instances and make that evaluation. That's part of where they- And, and the, the rationale for why it is that way in the first place or why the change or why this alternate version I think it's always important to have that why in there for your future selves, because, you know, everyone's inundated with everything all day long. It's like, why did we make that decision? 
you know, and people leave, you know, and there's always new people joining the team. And, you know, it's the same thing with code and commenting code. It's, it's commenting your design. Like, why did we make this decision? Here's the rationale. Um, here are the factors involved for either a decision or a non-decision in some cases. Like, yeah, we know this looks weird, but here's what was going on at the time. And here's why we did it this way. Mm -hmm. It's just providing that documentation. Yeah. The, the archives, if you will. The premise again behind this was the, so you think you need a design system. And so not just our conversation, but I thought I would reach out to some other people and get their perspective. Perfect. Um, talked with a, my friend Peter and one of his suggestions was to me, this falls under the category of what do you control and what do you influence mm -hmm. and start with the things you control. And the first thing you can do, oh, there's a lot of first things you can do, but <laughs> an, an easy first thing to do is just to do an audit. Every time I kind of run into a design system, I run into some people who want to do them, have them finished in some way before they are presented. And that's just not the approach that I believe works. Um, I think you get too deep into, oh, we need to have this specific element. We need to have this and that, that the other, but you don't think about, well, what do we, what does the people actually need to do their job? Start with an audit of the existing software. Usually there's existing software. If you have an existing system, start by doing an audit of it and using that audit as a conversation piece, like saying, hey, we have seven different primary buttons and probably you will. Most people have a lot of primary buttons. Uh, we have, you know, we have these, uh, this thing that was built 10 years ago and it's right next to this thing that was that was designed you know last month so they're very different what's working in in these two and it's a very conversational process where you're really trying to get down to not this is the one thing to rule them all but this is what works this is why it works and eventually hopefully you're leading towards something that is gonna be consistent you know that's that's kind of the first like the bottom tier of maslow's hierarchy of design system needs it just let's make it consistent <laughs> It, it does not need to do anything else, but like just kind of look and feel the same and work really well. I think that's the place where a lot of folks want to jump to like the real interesting stuff. But a lot of what's in a design system is not the real interesting stuff. It's, it's the basics of the typography, colors, buttons, all that. That's the, the, the grid system. All those things need to be considered before you start to dive into the interesting stuff. I also talked to uh, my friend Todd who's the, uh, I think he's interaction design director at Ziba. He was saying that part of the, the goal, this is more on the influence side of things, is you really need to develop a critical mass of interest because this can't be funded just from a project to project basis. Uh, I'm, gonna start, I'm gonna start strategically and then we can talk about tactics. So on the strategy side, um, one of the other parts that I always harp on with this type of problem um, is kind of is, is overall funding and focus. Um, and so when you have, you know, maybe she's got a patient portal or she's got some other type of software manifestation that is, I'm assuming customer focused or maybe it's nurse focused or whatever it winds up being. All too often, uh, these types of institutions like to think about those as projects. And so they fund them as projects. And so it's a thing that's time bounded and has certain amounts of money and, and with that, we get it done in a year or six months or two years or whatever it takes, but it's, it's a thing. And then when it's done, it's a nice diamond that you go put on the shelf and then you move on to the next problem. And that type of thinking gets you in serious amounts of trouble with these types of things because uh, you're building all of these systems on quicksand. And so like all of the underlying pieces of the software change while you're while while it's sitting on the shelf, and then you have to like pick it back up and fix it and put it back on the shelf. And so, right. so I give a lot of talks about funding as product and not project. And so it's a team that then takes over the thing and then just keeps on it while it's still alive, and then moves on to a different problem if you decide to sunset it. So that's one. And if you get into that mode, then there's not this division between design and engineering because it's all one team. And so it's not like design changed a thing and now engineering just lost all their velocity because they got to go fix something. It's much more about like we together just realized we needed a dark mode version and I guess we're going to have to do this. And it's everyone's problem. That that program level and supported at the C level or the operations level or the the consortium of directors, depending on how, how big your organization is. And like t those are the, the places to really start those conversations. But 
from a design group, if this is stemming from the design group, starting with the things you can actually control. I believe, I don't remember how long ago this was, but I did work with a client and they, one of the groups within the organization did kind of start their own design system in the hopes that it would kind of catch fire mm -hmm. and then it would kind of grow and absorb other, other teams. I don't know how that actually ended up, <laughs> but that was their goal because they weren't getting the support from above. So, so they thought, well, we'll just do our own and hope people realize the value that it brings and it'll kind of just grow uh, organically within the organization. I would hope that would work. <laughs> Every organization is different, so you never know. This is when I was talking to this woman yesterday about this, this quandary she's in. I said, you know, maybe you just start with a design system for the design team. Right. And say, you know, hey, everybody, this is what a button looks like. This is what it does. These are the different states it can be in. Do we all agree? Yes. All right. Boom. Here's our button. You ever need one? You go here to get it. Again, that goes back to what, what can you control? Uh, and that's something that she can politely dictate to the team. <laughs> yep, yep. Do you have a third uh, expert opinion? You know, I did, uh, <laughs> I did try to get other expert opinions and uh, I was asking on Twitter, which maybe I shouldn't mm. have, I should have asked some people directly. And I had two takers, uh, Peter and Todd, but uh, haven't gotten anybody else yet. So. Oh, okay. The other thing that came up uh, in this conversation was essentially establishing some design principles. So those, are, those are what'll help you make decisions about which controls yeah, to use exactly. and how to design them. Yeah. Yeah, and when someone comes and says, hey, I want to do something different, you can say, all right, well, does it mesh, mesh with our design principles? Because these are the things we're not bending on. One of the, the, the things we talked about was she wants to involve other people. So she's going to reach out to uh, the group of front-end devs who sit in engineering and invite them to sort of a lunch and learn kind of thing where let's talk about design principles. And I pointed her to uh, a website, which I'll link. It's an open source design principle site. Really, it just links to other design, other companies who have posted their design principles. I said, you know, pick five or six that resonate with you, put them on sticky notes, put them up on the wall, and then have lunch with these people and say, let's generate more things that we believe to be true, things that we feel are important and then start to cluster them and then start to refine them. You know, it doesn't have to be all done in, in one lunch and learn, mm -hmm. but by the end of it, you can have maybe two or three design principles that you all agree on as a group are important and that you're not going to budge on. So that you can right. then say to the organization, hey, you wanna do this, this doesn't mesh with our principle. Here's the risk for not being in line with these principles. Right. Or do we need to change our principles? Is something else changed externally? Right. Maybe we didn't drive any change. Think this through well enough or something. But it's all being rational and deliberate about making decisions. It's not just right. someone has an idea and everyone runs with it. It's being, like I said, intentional and thoughtful around these decisions. And it's providing that litmus test to say, are we still adhering to what we set out to do? The principles and the system are something that should be that you should crow about, you know, you should be using these as marketing tools for the value you provide as a design organization within the company. It may not be something people are clamoring to do immediately, but if you are, you know, once a week or once a month sending out a, basically a newsletter to the group internally of here's our accomplishments around the design system and, and the things that are baked and the things we're working on it helps to build that critical mass of interest over time. It's that, that political aspect of all the work that we do. Yep, getting recognition for it and getting recognition for it. Right. Yep. Oh, look, she, she's taking this very seriously and um, and we're, we're starting to see the value of, of doing this work. And if people realize that the investment that they're making in the system is showing benefits, that can only help you get investments in other things, right. <laughs> right. F future enhancements. Yeah. You know, we get there faster with two more designers. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, we'll you, say, <laughs> you say two more design systems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Throw them all in. Oh, yeah. Now, now, one thing we haven't talked about 
intentionally here is specific design system, software tools, at least from my perspective, a couple of reasons for that is because I haven't really been a part of the internal workings of one for over a year now, as far as helping decide and helping clients figure out how to implement one. And the, and the landscape changes so quickly that I'm a little bit hesitant to like throw some specifics out there because it's a very, you know, specific solution to a specific problem for each business. And every business has obviously specific needs, um, budgets, all those things. And so I'm, I'm personally hesitant to like throw out specific recommendations because it's, it's a tough thing to do in this format. I worked with a client where we started talking about that and, and they, you know, the first question everybody wants to talk about is tools. What tools, what tools do we use? Yep. And my take is that it kind of doesn't matter. Use the tools you have, but the real question is what is going to help you best collaborate? What is going to help you best and easiest share and make findable the work you collaborated on? Then, and to me, that's like, if you end up with Photoshop and SharePoint as your answers, <laughs> okay, that's yeah, fine. What, yeah, what's accessible to the pop, you know, the people that need to know have access to this? Um, yeah, and I said, I mean, that's always been my thing with design tools. It's you know, work, work with what's best for you, what you know best and feel most comfortable in. But in this, since it's reaching out to so many different groups, you need to find that kind of lowest common denominator or something that everyone is familiar with mm -hmm. and used to working around or, or get very used to, you know, if you're working in sketch, exporting the artboard to PDF and putting that in a findable place. If you're stuck on sketch, that's what you have to do because you can't collaborate on a file in sketch. Right. Right. That's a limitation. You can't share. Sure. Not everybody has sketch, so you can't share a sketch file tools like Figma, right. which is, yeah, I should say Figma, right. which is the, the latest hotness. Um, right. And it's and online. It's a lot and more it's... collaboration and all that kind of stuff. But in six months, it'll, there'll be something it'll else. It'll be replaced by something <laughs> else. And, and that's the point is like, yep. you know, again, you have to think in terms of outcomes, not tools. You know, I have to collaborate with my fellow designers. I have to collaborate with engineers. I have to share this information with other directors and C-level people and marketing and content so that they can understand what we're doing and, and potentially contribute as well. So for me, those are like screw tools. <laughs> it's just, yep. I know I, we, we lost one of our viewers on that <laughs> statement, but I mean, that's what people are looking for. That's what they're Googling and I get it, but really back yourself up and focus more on the needs. Like, like a good designer, like a good designer, <laughs> right, right, right. Not someone obsessed with tools. Yeah. So it's, I, I think it's, it is not an effort to take on lightly, but I also think most companies, even small ones should probably do it. Yeah. I think the scale <clears throat> changes. I think for small companies, it's, you always want consistency. You always want to streamline the process. Mm -hmm. So I agree with there. It's, it's how, how robust of a system do you need? Because even if you're a one person design shop, you don't want to start from scratch every time you're starting a new page or whatever type of uh, system you're built, you're designing. Um, so you should have your own internal pattern library, which going way back into the early days of design, that's what we all did. We all had our own personal <laughs> little, little library that we would use. And that was where the problems would come in. So when you start this, as your team grows and as your organization grows, that's why you need that collaboration. Yeah, I, I'm having painful memories back to <laughs> 2003, probably, where one of the people in the design group sent out an email with a Dreamweaver file attached, <laughs> or no, sorry, a link to Lotus Notes, where there was a Dreamweaver file stored that we were to use when we wanted to make a multi-column list box. And it was like, hey, I've tested this on all the browsers, and it works. Use this when you need it. Yeah, that was our design system, basically. Yeah. Stored in Lotus Notes as individual uh, component files. And kind of the, the flip side of that is I can remember way back when I was doing design work, my, my first design job, like you could look at the, the screens in the product, the finished product that we were selling and tell which designer worked on which feature. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> hey, nice to work, Larry. Right, right. <laughs> so you don't want that, but this was 20 years ago. And these, these we buttons, had lower standards back then. Buttons are so rounded corners, they're circles. <laughs> I know that font. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, at the very least, you're having a style guide, right? You know, right, yeah. These are the colors to use. These are the fonts to use. These are where right. to use them. It's not, you know, hey, I really like Roboto instead of Roboto uh, Slab right. or whatever. You know, it's, it is basic stuff. But, but then when you have moments like that where, you know, you've got the marketing department has established a, some brand guidelines and the colors they've chose aren't accessible you got to do something about that from a design perspective. Right. And it's not going to make any of the changes. That's a whole separate <laughs> part, part of this. Right. Yeah, you can yeah. identify the gaps, but then someone still has to go out and true up the system to match the guide. Go, go redo all that content. Yep. <laughs> well, maybe. Get on that. Yeah. Get on that, Larry. Get on that, Larry. <laughs> Larry is my 2020 <laughs> version of Gary. Gary was right. 2019. No, no Larry's were harmed in the making of this video channel. <laughs> Yeah. So it's, there's, there is a lot of information out there. In fact, um, a book came out yesterday by, I'm blanking on her name at the moment, but it's a, in a book apart book and I'll, I'll link it. It'll, it'll be in the comments. It'll be in the comments. Right. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's probably worth, worth yep. looking at. I haven't looked at it, but people that I know and trust have looked at it and said that, it's it's a good thing to look at when you're thinking about a, a design system and, and where to start. And that's what I was going to kind of wrap up with. Like in the end, like we're big proponents of it. And if you're already thinking about it, you probably already need it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so continue your journey. Um, hopefully we're giving some good uh, rationale for continuing on um, and getting the buy-in from from an organization because it's it's to your benefit, to everyone's benefit, especially your customers. Especially your customers. Yeah. Yep. And at the very least, you want to be able to sit down and look at everything you've made and say, yes, a single company made this. Exactly. And and that's the, the problem that the woman I'm talking with is is having, where it's like, you can look at the videos they're making, at the animated videos they're making, at the marketing material they're making, at the apps. It's not quite clear, except for the logo, that this is all made by one company. Right. And that's like a whole nother road to, to go down is like when you're talking about companies that act, that acquire other companies and then you're trying to get them all to look similar and that's a whole nother yeah let's a let's, whole nother thing <laughs> that's that's a tough problem to solve do a whole show on uh, that. let's never speak of this again all right good show people good show <laughs>